Coming up on DTNS, MediaTek's latest system on a chip can claim a lot of firsts. Microsoft wants to make Edge the all-in-one browser. And are you ready for robots in your company cafeteria? This is the Daily Tech News for Friday, November 19th, 2021. In Studio Redwood, I'm Sarah Lane. From lovely Cleveland, Ohio, I'm Rich Straffolino. And from Columbus, Ohio, I'm Rob Dunwood. Completing the Ohio trifecta and drawing the top tech stories, I'm Len Peralta. And from nowhere near Ohio, I'm the show's producer, Roger Shane. <laughs> Roger and I, we are outnumbered today. Yes. We've got the Ohio trifecta. That's how you Buckeyes. know it's a good show it's, full of Buckeyes. It's, it's, right. a good, it's a good Friday. Uh, we were talking before the show about uh, getting into car accidents and I don't know how to protect yourself in those situations. There is a longer show, version of the show. It's called Good Day Internet. If you haven't uh, joined it yet, please do be by becoming a Patreon at patreon.com slash DTNS. Also, big thanks to our top patrons. Today, they include Paul Reese, Dr. X17, and Dustin Campbell. Let's start with a few tech things you should know. Flipkart acquired a majority stake in the online pharmacy startup Sasta Sundar, which works with over 490 pharmacies in India. Flipkart plans to use the stake to launch a healthcare vertical called Flipkart Health Plus. Competitors like Amazon India, Reliance Retail, and Tata Digital have all either launched or acquired online pharmacies in the last year. The U.S. Federal Reserve and FDIC formalized the computer security incident notification requirements for banking organizations and their bank service providers. Under this new regulation, as of May 2022, so in the future, but only by a little bit, banks must report major cybersecurity incidents to federal officials within 36 hours. It also outlines when banks may must report cybersecurity incidents to customers as well. Twitter updated its developer documentation to state it was in the process of discontinuing support for AMP sites. AMP support will be fully retired in Q4 2021. Twitter's Android and iOS apps currently load full web pages rather than AMP versions, so well on their way. Twitter also began rolling out its in-app tipping feature on Android after launching on iOS in September. Facebook said it's testing controls to adjust people's ranking performance preferences in its newsfeed. This could potentially increase posts from friends and family while decreasing content from groups, for example. The company would also make existing features that impact newsfeed content like favorites and snooze easier to access. And next year, the UK will update the highway code to bar drivers from using devices to take photos uh, or to take photos or play games while driving. The rules will specifically make clear these bans apply even when stopped at a traffic light or otherwise stopped in traffic, but you are still driving the car. Calling and texting while driving has already been illegal under the highway code. Hands-free devices are still legal while driving, and the rules will exempt contactless payments using a phone while stationary, so Starbucks is still in luck. All right, let's talk a little bit more about a flagship chip that potentially could change things going forward. Rob, tell us about Absolutely. it. Absolutely. Strap in, because this is a this is a long one here, but I want to go ahead and read this. <laughs> so seeing a media tech SOC on mobile devices can often lead to an assumption that the device won't have top-notch performance. While the company made stabs at a flagship SOC a few years ago, it found a lot of success in the mid-range and budget segments. With this strategy, MediaTek now has 40% of the mobile SOC market share, along with 28% of 5G SOCs. Now the company is trying its hand at flagship performance with the ambitious Dimensity 9000 mobile SOC. MediaTek is going for a lot of firsts on this new 9000. It's the first publicly announced chip to use the newly designed core in one high power, three mid-tier, and four efficiency core configurations. MediaTek claims Geekbench multi-core performance on par with Apple's A15 chip. In the Android world, MediaTek says it offers 35% better performance while bringing in 37% more efficiency than other flagships. It claims 35% better graphics performance and 60% improved power efficiency with its 10-core Mali G710 GPU compared to other flagships. Its AI processing unit claims 16% better performance than Google's Tensor SoC. Its ISP will support 8K AV1 decoding, support up to 180 hertz HDR displays, supports up to 320 megapixel image sensors, or up to 332 megapixel sensors used simultaneously. Even its 5G modem claims some impressive specs, with the first use of 3CC carrier aggregation at sub-6 gigahertz, 
to support downloads up to seven gigabits per second. The modem does lack millimeter wave support, which is MediaTek is saying that is based on needs outside of the U.S. Commercial devices for this chip are expected in Q1 2022. So what I think is going to go on here, you're going to see companies like Oppo, um, One, um, Nokia, even Samsung on their lower devices like the A32, they are about to get really, really competitive with higher end devices that generally come from Samsung and, and, uh, and Apple but you're still gonna see them at this mid-range or maybe higher mid-range price point where you can get a really high-end phone as far as the way that it works, but at the prices of a six, seven, eight hundred dollar device as compared to one that may cost as much as twice as much as that. And I know TSMC's new N4 mode is, you know, it, it's a big deal of the announcement. And Rob, it's it does sound like if you're interested in, in this, you're pretty pumped. It's pretty cool. But for someone like me who's like, cool, how does this make my next smartphone better? So I, I think that what this is doing is that, you know, like you're still going to have folks who I want to get whatever Samsung S is the high end. I still want to get whatever iPhone, you know, the new i 14, whatever the highest end model is. You're still going to have that. But what this really does, particularly folks who are into Android, it's going to allow you to get a relatively high-end phone at a mid-price. I don't think anyone would expect these uh, MediaTek uh, SoC-driven uh, uh, devices to cost the same as what like the new Galaxy S22 uh, will when it comes out next year. But you might see specs that actually operate like that. So it, I think you're just going to see, uh, once again, the utilitarianism of phones to where I don't need to have the highest end. I can get kind of close to it and maybe pay half as much. Yeah, and the challenge here, I mean, no surprise here, ongoing chip shortage. You know, they're coming out and announcing this. They're still partnering with TSMC. Obviously, they have, you know, they they make a lot of chips. But if they're the first to announce this, but not necessarily, you know, based on this new ARM design, not the first to ship with that. You know, I, I know they're, be, they're saying Q1 2022, not too far off. You know, we should maybe see devices at CES or something like that. They're going to be using this new chip. That that comparison to the Apple performance, though, again, as a as a as a chip nerd, a lot of things to be excited about here, just like just kind of cool design choices that they're making, cool specs that they're showing off. As an end user, you just really care. It's like, okay, is this laggy? Can it support? Does the display look nice when I scroll on? You know, with that high refresh rate, does you know, can I watch all of my media on? It's not going to be a problem. Are my games playing nice? That that benchmark of A15, like Apple A15 performance, you know, is kind of you know, top of the mobile field, depending on the benchmark that you're looking at, you know, obviously all those caveats, if it can hit that, and again, not necessarily hit the Apple price point, uh, like Rob was saying, uh, you know, uh, a big, a big shift in how we perceive media tech uh, chips going forward, for sure. Rich, right, I think in, you're, oh, go, go ahead, Rob. I was just going to say like the tensor processor, it just came out. Um, a, I don't even know if you can say a few months ago, but this is saying that it, you know, these, these devices are going to have 16% better performance than something that Google just released. So like I said, I think you're really going to see high end devices with that low mid range to mid range price set, uh, which is going to excite a lot of Android users. Well, should we talk about robots, everyone? Please. Talk Please say yes. Okay. Because <laughs> we're going to. <laughs> Wired had a great write-up today about everyday robots. You might say, everyday robots, what's that? Everyday robots is actually a fleet of 100 robots, 100 plus, in Alphabet X's Mountain View headquarters. And those robots have a job, and that is to keep things nice and neat within those headquarters. So, for example, picture this. At 1.30 in the afternoon, a one-armed robot enters the company's cafe, has four wheels, has some cameras, LiDAR sensors on, on the head to understand uh, where to go for navigation. The point of this robot is to clean the tables in the cafe because, I don't know, maybe somebody left a mess after their sandwich and have as little disturbance to humans who might also be in the cafe as possible. So after determining a table is empty, and again, the LiDAR and the, and the cameras are, are going to be able to do that to the best of its ability, the everyday robot covers the surface of the table with a disinfectant, it's clear, using a squeegee arm, which is connected to its arm, and then withdraws the arm to squeeze out the excess fluid into a bucket attached to its base. Now, Wired notes that after a few weeks, people eating lunch are seemingly already used to sharing their space with the fleet. Now, you might say, how many people are really in the cafeteria? Well, not that many people are in an office 100% of the time at this point. 
but it's not it's not nobody. It's sort of a good time to test this type of thing. Everyday Robots is a project of X. Uh, the cafe is one of several testing spots on the Google campus where a small percentage of employees have returned to in-person work. The Everyday Project wants to act as a bit of a proof of concept that robots can operate in the wild, living amongst the rest of us, not just in controlled environments like factories where they already do really well. Previously, the company tested robots sorting trash into proper recycling bins, for example. Norwegian engineer Hans-Peter Brondmo joined X back in 2015, now the leading everyday robot effort after Andy Rubin departed the company. And you might say, okay, well, everyday robots sound useful, but what about the robots that do backflips? I've seen those YouTube videos or <laughs> scale walls or buildings or, you know, do superhuman Spider-Man type stuff. Brondmo tells Wired, quote, you might say our robots are slow, but what they're actually doing is fully autonomous. And they're working in the world that we live in. And they're actually learning to do things, simple tasks that are getting more and more advanced. We're bringing robots that can live and work alongside us into the world that we live in, as opposed to us moving into the world that they live in. Cleaning tables, not the only thing that Everyday Robots has learned to do, a project to help them open conference room doors in order to check carbon levels inside closed conference rooms to make sure that humans are safe to go in uh, after the fact. Took about 10 hours. And then, you know, once you get it right with one robot, they all learn it. There have been ballet trials to see how well they can mimic the moves of a classically trained human dancer, for example. So we're not stopping with conference rooms, everybody. <laughs> And one of the things that's really interesting about this is that uh, Google has been using, or Everyday Robots has been using uh, virtual training to kind of uh, to, to amplify this, right? So you, you're not limited to, oh, there's not a lot of people in the cafeteria, so perhaps you know you're not going to have this huge sample size, or like you're you're limited by the amount of robot runtime that you have, like theoretically, like these robots can literally only be in one place at a time, so you're limited by that. Uh, this has been a huge trend that we've seen with Waymo. We've been seeing this with what Facebook is kind of offering with a lot of their toolkits uh, for for like kind of the soft robotics and stuff like that, where you're able to, with machine learning, kind of do this virtual training much more rapidly. So you can do stuff in 10 hours that would ordinarily, you'd have to build up a huge real world data set. Um, and then with that, you can then refine it going forward, uh, which is, you know, theoretically, which is opening the door for a lot of these more autonomous use cases. And, you know, if they can figure out the economics of this, it, it makes it very interesting. I like the fact that they are using that AI learning um, where they're running simulations to figure out what the robots are going to do, because you pretty much know how the robots are going to act. What is nice or, or the timing is nice is that we are still, you know, in this post pandemic, you know, the, the, the cafeterias are not going to be that crowded. So the, the unpredictable part are going to be people. I know me. I'm going to throw a piece of ham at the robot just to see how the robot responds. <laughs> So Rob, how uh, could you? Fewer fewer people. Uh, while these things actually fine tune, um, you know, their uh, you know their training, they they fine tune how they operate. It's probably a good thing as compared to just having a full campus of people, and you have a fair amount of like me going to mess with the robot to see if you can get it off this game. I mean, I gotta say. Not, not that <laughs> those of you who are like, I work for Alphabet and I don't want to go back to the office ever. And those of you who say, I want to go back to the office. And there's a small uh, crossover of people who actually are in the office, at least part time. This is a great time to test these sorts of things. Now, right. sure, Google's campus is one of the largest in the world. All the companies can't uh, perform the same trials as, as Google. Certainly not. And this is very early stage days. But... It sounds like, you know, and again, this Wired article, they, you know, they, they spend a little bit of time just, just uh, you know, just observing and seeing if it, I don't know, seemed like some like crazy novelty where everybody was like, oh my God, the robots are coming in. And and that was not the case. It sounded as though at least the the folks, and again, these are folks that probably work in the X department at some uh, in some form. So they're sort of used to this, but uh, felt that it was pretty unintrusive. 
All right, well, next up here, Microsoft will expand its online shopping tools in Edge, planning to roll out support for price tracking on recently viewed items. Microsoft already offers a lot of uh, kind of e-commerce related tools like price comparisons, price history, and built-in coupons. Microsoft is also piloting a feature to make it easier to change a leaked password. Edge already includes a leaked password monitoring feature, but this new feature would then automatically navigate you to the site to change your password directly. And then Edge has uh, you know, a password suggestion tool uh, to create a strong, unique password as well. In other browser news, Brave announced this week it was adding integrated crypto wallet support to its browser rather than using an extension. And it offered an official Brave extension. Now this is just built in the browser. This adds uh, to a number of cryptocurrency and privacy features that really has been the browser's hallmark since it's kind of been out there. It seems though like kind of the, the bigger narrative about this is that across the board, we're seeing browsers just getting more complex. Some would call this feature rich. Other might say, hey, everything's getting a little bloated out there. Seems like every major browser is adding features. Just this year, Chrome has offered things like instant captioning for video, as well as uh, text text fragment linking, so you can link directly to jump to uh, specific text. Firefox has added focus mode and expanded user profiles. Opera launched cashback shopping features, you know, kind of following along with what Edge has been doing. Kind of like looking at these these features added to there, are we past the point where browsers can be, I don't know, just a browser, Rob? I'm curious what your thoughts are. Yeah, I, I think so. In, in the case specifically with Edge, uh, they have for last year or two, they've been it's been faster than Chrome. It opens up faster than Chrome. It's actually a really nice browsing experience when all you want to do is browse. The problem for Microsoft, people are still using Chrome. Chrome, you know, Chrome is you know it, it is it is the browser of choice for just about Earth. So I think what Microsoft and what, uh, you know, Brave, what they're deciding to do is like, well, you know what, you know, we, we have the speed, let's try to keep the speed, but let's add other things into our browser. Now, we know that that's going to make the browser heavy and maybe run a little slower, but can we pull some market share by putting things in our browser that maybe Chrome has to have added with an extension? You know, it's just, you can just do this thing in Edge, you can just do this thing in Brave and see if we can pull some market share there, because honestly, it's not really close compared to what Chrome has over these other uh, browsers. And I think this is kind of a side effect, another side effect of basically every browser outside of what Safari being Chromium based also is like you literally can't, I don't want to say you can't, it's very hard to differentiate a performance when you're all using the same open source, uh, you know, kind of platform to build off of. So you need kind of feature ads to be like, oh, hey, I can save $2 on this pack of pencils I'm going to buy. Thank you, Edge, or whatever, you know, stuff like that. Um, and we've seen Microsoft utilizing their OS advantage, you know, their, their baked in OS advantage with Edge to kind of push people to the browser as well. That's kind of a, a, a little bit of a separate issue. And I think the other thing is, this also, you know, kind of going to Brave with moving an extension into a core browser feature is that extensions are just seem like they're just kind of an endless security nightmare. And so the ability, like the idea of, oh, it's nice to be able to extend, only get the features that I want. I think a lot of browser makers are rethinking that uh, from a security perspective as well. You know, Brave announcing the integrated crypto wallet rather than extension uh, into the browser. Now this is Brave, Brave known for security, privacy. Mm. That's what, what Brave does well. That's great. Uh, I, I've had a little experience with this sort of stuff in extension, extension land with other browsers. Shall not be named. Chrome, Firefox, looking at you. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, you know, where you're kind of like, even with a VPN, this is a little, it's a little squirrely. I think that what Microsoft is doing seems to be catching up with what some other browsers who may have less market share just do better. And that makes perfect sense. Uh, it, it will be interesting to see what a browser does, uh, you know, six months to a year from now. And I guess if you want just like a completely stripped down browser, there's still like the open source Chromium browser, which theoretically has a lot of this stuff, you know, uh, stripped out um, that is available. And, you know, there are there are some other open source options and stuff like that that definitely don't get have the market share and don't have the development resources necessarily, but uh, can still provide you, I guess, with that purely stripped down version. Well, if you've heard anything and you say, you know what, that struck a chord, we'd like you to hear, we'd talk to you, we'd like you to talk to us more about that, or you have any ideas of what we should talk about on a future show, one way to let us know is in our subreddit. Submit stories and vote on them at dailytechnewsshow.reddit.com. 
Our friend Nika Monford is back with an entrepreneur who's created an app that offers automated investment and education tools for the black community. Take it away, Nika. Hi, this is Nika Monford, a.k.a. Tech Savvy Diva of the Snob West Show. In the Tech and While Black segment, I will bring awareness to a black technology leader who is advancing the tech community through their innovations across the spectrum of industries. Today in Tech and While Black, the spotlight is on Trevor Rozier Bird, founder of Stackwell Capital Inc., a fintech company aimed at helping build generational wealth in the black community while making investing more accessible to those who have historically been shut out. The mobile application delivers automated investment portfolio tools and education to help build black wealth. Trevor has nearly 20 years experience in the asset management community, first as a lawyer and then as a business executive. He earned his BA in political science and theology from Boston College and his JD from Boston University's School of Law. He has worked at several law firms as an associate and senior associate. He then transitioned to become an accomplished Wall Street executive by serving as vice president and managing director at State Street, which is one of the world's premier and largest investment firms. Additionally, he is a member of Launchpad Venture Group, where he serves as an angel investor, advisor, and mentor. Stackwell is currently taking names on its early access waiting list through its website, stackwellcapital.com, and will conduct a private beta later this year with an expected full public release in early 2022. The work that Trevor and Stackwell is doing is most certainly vital to my community. This is game-changing, I mean life-changing work, and I for one cannot wait to see this venture flourish. To find out more about Trevor Rozier Bird and his work, you can follow him on Twitter at TRunnerRB and by visiting StackwellCapital.com. History is being made in real time every single day, so let's celebrate it now. When we are aware of all innovative voices, especially those in underrepresented groups, the tech community thrives. Be sure to tune into the next Teching While Black, where we highlight black tech innovators from around the globe. Thank you, Nika Monford, obviously of the Snob OS podcast and uh, and a frequent contrib- contributor to us on this very show. Thank you, Nika. All right. Well, Sarah, Rob, uh, here's a new thing you need to hear about NFTs. Just kidding. They're everywhere (laughs) just today. This is just the rundown of NFT stories we saw in the headlines today. We had the NFL is selling NFTs attached to game day tickets with Ticketmaster. We had Macy's selling Thanksgiving Day Parade themed NFTs with proceeds donated to charity. And Adidas will sell NFTs tied to an unspecified event and you don't really own them. Anyway, it can be a lot. If you can't keep up on all the NFT2s, and believe me, you probably can't, Australian artist and programmer Joffrey Huntley has a solution for you, the NFT Bay. Modeled to look almost identical to the Pirate Bay, the site actually offers a 15 terabyte torrent that claims to offer all the NFTs from the Ethereum and Solana blockchains. Now to be clear, Huntley considers this to be an art project, not, you know, like he doesn't really expect you, I guess, a ton of people to download all of the 15 terabytes, even if you could. Uh, but he uh, does make an interesting point about NFTs kind of as part of this. Huntley claims that most NFTs don't actually store any media on the blockchain itself. Rather, most often they just hold a link to the content the token is attached to. If this links out to an online data store or some other web server, that you know, like Google Drive or, or even you know AWS, something like that, it likely at some point may not be available, potentially compromising the value of the NFT itself. Hunley himself thinks NFTs have a future as a form of digital representation, but is skeptical that it actually requires a blockchain. He's thinking about uh, like the value of, uh, he compared it to like the blue check mark on Twitter as like that kind of token having value, but it's more about expression and representation than necessarily being tied to the blockchain. So, uh, uh, you know, Rob, are you gonna be downloading the the 15 terabytes to to get all your, your NFT artwork? I, I won't be downloading the 15 terabytes um, that I won't be doing, but I am interested in just seeing how NFTs are being used with media, with, you know, with, you know, music, with art. 
Um, and, and I had someone explain it to me. Um, and I said, just put it in layman's terms, because why would I pay money for something that I can get for free? And the way they explained it to me was that, you know, think of like when you do like a Google image search, you can go see millions, hundreds of millions of images when you search for them on Google. You don't own that image. You don't necessarily have a right to that image, but you, you can actually see the the high resolution, uh, you know, uh, you know, expression of that image when you go look at it on Google. When you have the NFT, you have a license or you have a right that says that you have a piece or you have some um, you know, ownership is probably not the right you know way to say it, but you actually have some license to that image to where you could then sell your version of it to someone else. Um, that you could, you know, you could pass it down to someone, and there is an associated value. Whereas you can't just go take a copy of the Mona Lisa or a picture of the Mona Lisa that you get off of Google and say, "Hey, I want to start selling these. Um, I now own this." But with an NFT, you, in some ways, you can kind of do that. I know that I'm probably have NFT experts are saying, "Oh, Rob, you're doing a horrible job." But you know, the way I understand it is that you don't own the thing you own a right or a license to the yeah. thing that you are ultimately uh, able to pass on for monetary value. Well, and one of the things that I think Huntley kind of points to, but I think also deserves some clarification is that whole point about, Hey, this just points to a URL. So like if you buy this an NFT representing a digital artwork, that may actually, you know, not be available in the future. There is an incentive though, for whoever the, the, the creator is or the, the owner or like the, the, the platform that's hosting that because there is a royalty dynamic to NFTs. So like that's one of the reasons they're really they're they're interesting to a lot of artists is they get a royalty anytime that NFT ch NFT changes hands. Mm -hmm. So like if you're an artist, you have an incentive to keep that piece of art available uh, in in the way that it's it's documented in the blockchain so that you can th th that it won't decrease the value of the NFT and and kind of go forward with that. So I do think that is something that as a as a uh, as a consumer facing product sometimes it does get uh, forgotten uh, in that you know the artist or whoever the main I guess the maintainer is is has a vested interest in keeping that available. Huntley's point still well taken though that you know if it if it's just pointing to a URL that may not be there at all times. This kind of just you know to go back to our conversation about the all-in-one browser and what a browser can't do. This feels like the same idea. You know, the, you have so many people, myself included, who kind of go like NFTs. I'm mildly interested, at least just to know what I'm talking about. But there, it depends on you know where do I find you know if Len Peralta has an NFT that I might be interested in. I need a reminder of where that would be. And if there is a more central repository, sort of browser esque, you know, that is able to make a lot of this uh, these commodities more available to people who are interested, even if they're just browsing or even if they're buying. I think that that's going to be what this looks like in the not too distant future. Yeah. And I think that's, a that's, I, it kind of reminds me of the challenge of the web initially. Like when we think about like the blockchain seems like this othering thing, like where it's like, all right, it's this ledger, it exists out there, it's permanent. But like, I, I feel like as we become more comfortable with that, the idea of like, like to your point about a central repository, an NFT enthusiast will tell you the blockchain is your your central repository that you can you can always find all this stuff. And and that sure, like, but and, yeah, and that's, and that would be like but the, as a browser, that's yeah, that's and, what and, I'm talking about. And and I feel like it's it's a lot of it is a front end problem and also a still newness to this as for, as a consumer product, certainly. Like in, in the same way that the early internet, when it was text based, uh, had the same you know uh, kind of a same perception issue. We need we're we're at the links version of blockchain right now. And we need Mozilla <laughs> the, or the Netscape <laughs> Navigator to come in, right? Something like that. Something like that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I will just say this. Right if you buy digital art, download it <laughs> along with your NFT. Sa save yourself some trouble because you're, you're right. It, it could, that link could go to nothing at some point. So if, you, if you're buying NFTs, make sure you download them and physically have a copy of whatever digital thing it is you purchased. Rich, what's in the mailbag today? Sarah, I'm, I'm so glad you asked because Michael wrote in uh, with some thoughts about the whole Apple uh, repair program uh, that they announced this week. He said, I thought of a different angle on Apple on the whole right to repair parts sales thing. 
they're going to be able to sell specialized tools for phone repair to thousands of individuals who otherwise would have gone to a central repair shop. There is probably decent profitability in enabling people to repair their own devices using a guide that you provide. I view it as a, oh, I need the special action or Apple suction cup to remove my glass and also this Apple screwdriver. There is gold in them, their hills. <laughs> Uh, and Michael, I would say certainly that uh, I mean, like just kind of reading this, certainly Apple could make some money off of that. I would just say, though, that like I fix its level of profitability is at a several orders of magnitude different than Apple's existing level of profitability. So maybe that was a, a definitely, a, con a you know, a consideration. I'm sure they, they wouldn't do it to lose money. But, you know. There's a limit. Well. There. Rob, Apple's, yeah, I, I'd love Apple, to hear your thoughts on on this whole story. This week. Apple sells a twenty dollar microfiber cloth <laughs> that has an Apple logo on it that you could get without the Apple logo for like a dollar ninety nine. Why not do this with other stuff? Sure. Um, yeah, it's just is one of those things to where you know what we we have to allow people to you know to fix these things. You're going to have some people who are going to want to do it themselves, so let's sell them the official Apple branded version of the screwdriver. Let's just, you know let's sell them the Apple branded version of the suction cup, as compared to letting them go to some other company that where they can buy those things and we not actually make a profit off of it. Well, if you have feedback on anything that we talk about on this show, anything we might talk about on a future show, we would love your feedback. The way to send it to us is via email, feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com. We also want to give a special thanks to Naji Najumi, who's one of our top lifetime supporters for DTNS. Thank you for all the years of support, Naji. Keep it coming, Naji. You're the best. Uh, also, thank you to Lynn Peralta, who's been drawing up a storm this entire show. <laughs> Len, what do you got for us? Well, you know, uh, before the show started, I was going to draw everyday robots. <laughs> robots versus pirates, I think. Oh, man, who is the winner? In the end, I went with the pirates because uh, uh, pirates are fun to draw. Robots, I've drawn robots before, but I don't think I've ever drawn a pirate for the show before. And uh, this is a, <laughs> a a pirate, you know, and it's also a great idea to, to use all the pirate vernacular. So he's saying, yo, ho, ho, 15 terabytes of NFTs, matey, quite the booty. You own nothing, scurvy dog. Arr! So I don't know. That was take it for what it's worth. This is actually I'm gonna, probably going to turn this into an NFT after the show as well. <laughs> so that could be in that. that 15 terabyte group of stuff as well. Um, if you want to get this, if you just get it at my Patreon, patreon.com forward slash Len or at my online store, LenPeraltaStore.com, where, of course, I am drawing custom holiday cards for all who want them. So check it out, LenPeraltaStore.com. Excellent. Uh, yeah, you might have said, well, uh, you know, robots versus pirates. The pirates kind of take over the robots if they they're do. good pirates. I agree. I after agree. all. <laughs> Rob Dunvid, also good to have you on the show today. Let folks know where they can keep up with what you've been up to lately. Well, just chugging along with a couple of podcasts, the SMR podcast and my new show, The Tech John. And uh, you can reach me at Rob Dunwood at all things. So just at Rob Dunwood, uh, you'll find me. Excellent. Well, folks, you probably already know this, but just a reminder, we're live Monday through Friday at 4.30 p.m. Eastern. That's 2130 UTC. You can find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. We would love to have you join us live if you can. We'll be back on Monday with Robert here. Talk to you then. This week's episode of Daily Tech News Show were created by the following people. Host, producer, and writer, Tom Merritt. Host, producer, and writer, Sarah Lane. Executive producer and booker, Roger Chang. Producer, writer, and host, Rich Straffolino. Video producer and Twitch producer, Joe Kuntz. Associate producer, Anthony Lemos. Spanish language host, writer, and producer, Dan Campos. News host, writer, and producer, Jen Cutter. Science correspondent, Dr. Nikki Ackermans. Social media producer and moderator, Zoe Detterdeen. Our mods, Beatmaster, W. Scottis One, BioCow, Kath Kipper, Jack Shid, Steve Guadarama, Paul Reese, Matthew J. Stevens, J.D. Gallup. Mod and hosting by Dan Christensen. Video hosting, rather. Video feed by Sean Way. Music and art provided by Martin Bell, Dan Luters, Mustafa A., Acast, Creative Ast Arts, and Len Peralta. Live ours. I, live art performed by Len Peralta. Acast ad support by Trace Gaynor. Patreon support from Stephen Brown. 
Contributors for this week's show include Justin Robert Young and Rob Dunwood. Guests on this week's show include Stephanie Humphrey. And thanks to all our patrons who make every show possible. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>